All right. I guess I'll kick us off here, John, unless you wanted to uh, do the intro. I think I did the intro last time. Yeah, you've, you've got a good intro. All right. All right. So <clears throat> this is going to be the first half of two parts of a presentation, and we're going to use the term half loosely. Um, there's no necessary halfway point of this presentation, so um, we'll probably go a little bit of ways and, and uh, then wrap it up, and then we'll pick up the second half of it tomorrow. Or not tomorrow, next month. Next month, definitely not tomorrow. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, feel free to ask questions, uh, you know, either conceptual questions or about the equipment that we have. Um, this definitely needs to be an interactive discussion. This doesn't have to be just listening to John and I talk for 32 uh, slides of material. So. All right, so some of this is, is ground I know that uh, we've talked about in the club before, um, but you know, some of the questions get asked, you know, what's the point about repeaters? Um, you know, there's, it's, there, a lot of them are idle these days. Um, and it seems like with each passing year, there are fewer long-term conversations, um, aside from some of the um, scheduled nets. Um, so, you know, we, we know that repeaters are, you know, the repeater use is dropping. Um, there, you know, many of them are 99% idle. Uh, if uh, you'll remember when we were looking at making the analog to digital conversion of 275, I think we clocked um, 31 minutes of transmit time a day and 30 minutes of it was the nightly pajama net. And then one minute was probably the telemetry, <laughs> the te telemetry mm -hmm. transmissions. So what, what, you know, why are we still talking about repeaters? In and I'll just throw in too, Jason, real quick while you're there is if anybody's traveled in the last couple of years, um, this area seems to have more activity than most places that I've been through. Um, and I've, I've done a fair amount of driving around the country the last two or three years and and had their radio scanning the whole time. And I got to tell you, you drive a long way before you hear conversations. And, um, and in this area, not only do you hear conversations, but you hear local people in the area on those repeaters. You know, maybe they're linked to something too, but, but you hear actual local users. So I think we're, you know, I don't have any hard data to back this up, but at least anecdotally, I think we're probably more active than most areas which is still a lot less than it was 15 or 20 years ago. Yeah. So, so what's the point? Why are we going to talk about this? What are some of the things that are driving these discussions? So, um, you know, most new hams are techs and unless the um, proposal to realign the uh, license class privileges um, gets passed, um, then for practical purposes, Techs are generally limited to VHF and up, which in most cases means FM in the United States, which means repeaters for the most part. Um, yes, there are HF privileges for techs. No, it's really not all that useful. Um, <clears throat> obviously, we know repeaters um, in the radio community have been replaced by cell phones and the internet. Um, that's just a fact. Those users aren't coming back, um, and we have to design repeater systems accordingly. Um, the last one, um, and you know, we we've run into this in this area, uh, notably with the Copley location recently, um, that many previously accessible high-profile sites um, are going away. Um, TV towers are uh, kicking off repeater owners, uh, not through any animus against the you know the amateur radio community. Uh, but the guidelines for the engineering of towers has changed. And um, where an amateur could graft a, you know, an antenna on a TV tower in a handshake agreement uh, just doesn't work in 2020 anymore. Uh, statewide radio systems like Ohio Marks are replacing local sites and systems. Uh, John mentioned earlier um, supporting the Rittman Police Department uh, with their radio system over time. Uh, but, you know, with the advent of Marks and then now even FirstNet, 
um, most of the local systems are going away and hams who had a lot of who helped out with those systems and then sort of got tower space in return uh, those systems are going away uh, new city and county managers are risk averse uh, everyone knows what, what a litigious climate we live in in 2020 um, and if you can get them to call you back um, they're fairly uh, risk averse and john chuckles <laughs> Um, and finally, uh, tall buildings want rental income. Uh, cell phone providers with 5G coming out um, is going to be a huge revenue stream for building owners to charge rental to the um, cell phone companies, especially in urban areas where they want to put the uh, millimeter wave, um, 5G, they're, they're lower profile, they don't go as far, so they need lots more sites. Um, so building owners uh, don't want anything uh, conflicting with that revenue stream. Um, we do have the influx of uh, inexpensive um, DMR land mobile radios uh, that work in ham bands. Um, this recently has sparked a, re a resurgence of interest in digital voice. Um, obviously, there has been DSTAR for a number of years. You've had uh, several iterations of the uh, Wires, Wires X um, system fusion systems that have come out. Um, but with DSTAR and YSF especially, um, especially DSTAR, uh, those digital modes are rarely, were rarely used because the cost of um, ICOM repeaters was ridiculous. And um, Yesu AMS repeaters, at least the first version of the DR1, uh, had a number of uh, problems. So there's lots of people with digital radios that they've never really used. So the position is that the amateur radio community needs to shift its thinking uh, on repeaters. Uh, John, why don't you go ahead and take this slide? Okay. Yeah, what, what we're advocating for is, is a little different way of thinking. Um, that, you know, repeaters, uh, you know, 15 years ago, I think the idea was that repeaters had some attraction to people uh, to replace you know, what was mobile phones at the time, 15 or 20 years ago, yeah, that battle's already over. Um, we're, we need to, to think about attracting youth, but I, repeaters aren't necessarily the way to do that. You know, to keep the hobby alive, we need to always have an influx of, of younger folks that are gonna want more than just an analog FM repeater. Um, Having a repeater on the air is not going to save if, you know, if there's, if it really hits the fan and we need communications, repeaters might be a little piece of that, but just the fact that a repeater is on the air isn't going to, you know, save that world. Um, and uh, we're trying to advocate that what you can do with repeaters these days is use them as more of a last mile delivery. So, so something that, um, Maybe you have smaller repeaters that you have locally and you bring in a community of people and then interconnect those repeaters with other repeaters uh, and maybe in other areas and maybe on the other side of town that is more of a community oriented thing. So folks that are interested in making or contesting or, um, you know, Mac computers or, you know, whatever their, whatever their topic is. Uh, also, by having more smaller machines, it opens up some of the possibilities for experimentation and gives a little bit of a playground that, that people can learn how these things work and learn a little more about uh, RF. And of course, the, the labor of love aspect, um, you'll find most repeater owners and operators are not overpaid for what they do. Uh, so there's, there's definitely something in there that um, uh, they're either a little insane in the membrane or, uh, or maybe it's a labor of love, not sure, maybe a little bit of both. Right, go ahead, Jason. My screen still sharing? Yep, it is okay. now. Yeah, just, just flip yep, so, over. Yep. Okay, I lost the the box around the screen. I wasn't sure what it was. Oh, yep. what it was doing. Okay, um, so some of the strategies um, that we're going to talk about, and, and we're not going to necessarily hammer these home in detail, but you're going to see this as a theme woven throughout what we're going to talk about. 
Um, as John mentioned, um, last mile delivery. So develop, develop and deploy repeaters that are network connected and that work well and are stable. And what we mean by network connected is TCP IP, um, IP internet connectivity. Um, not, uh, you know, there's, there's lots of interesting work being done with like Arden and some of that kind of thing. Um, but for this strategy, we are not recommending that type of um, network connectivity. Uh, we don't want to abandon analog FM. We want to enhance it. Um, deploy repeater systems that are complementary and that are interconnected. Uh, John talked about communities of interest, uh, but you know, with the loss of the, some of the higher profile sites, if you want to maintain coverage, you're going to start needing more repeaters at lower profiles. People who live on hills, uh, maybe a couple story building that you can talk the owner into sticking an antenna on, um, things like that. Um, and that helps, and, and then linking them helps use those existing low and mid profile sites effectively, and then you fill in the coverage gaps. Uh, another win uh, is resiliency. Uh, have capa capability and capacity to support someone else losing a site. Uh, there was, you know, we, we have, as John mentioned, we have a pretty uh, good set of repeaters in this area. And when the Copley Tower was lost, that took down um, three different repeaters. Uh, the uh, two meter uh, Copley machine, and I'm blanking on the call sign for that one, uh, that took uh, the KA8 OAD DMR machine off, and it took one of the uh, six meter receive sites for the N8 XPK six meter system down. Uh, we were fortunate enough that um, the receive site loss uh, could be moved elsewhere and really didn't affect too much coverage. Uh, the uh, people who largely used the Copley machine had moved over, I think, to the Barberton machine. And uh, after a couple of months, uh, Ken was able to put his other machine back on the air at a different location. Um, but, you know, we might see an acceleration of those sorts of uh, situations. Uh, we want to consciously provide a space for learning and development. Uh, you know, repeaters should be used and... I think there's historically been a fear of uh, people worried about breaking it or not following some sort of unwritten rules for operating a repeater. Um, but, you know, we have to be clear with the users, with all amateur radio users, uh, the repeaters are there to be used. They're not there to sit up on a pedestal waiting for a Aries activation or a Skywarn net. Uh, get in there, use them, um, link them to things. Uh, you're not going to break it. Um, and obviously, um, lower investment costs. As I mentioned before, the ICOM repeater systems um, are ridiculously expensive. Um, lower investment costs. Use less expensive equipment. Um, with many lower profile sites, you don't need huge, massive, shiny equipment that'll survive 30 years of the apocalypse. Um, you know, if you lose a site for a couple of days, it's okay. You go out, you swap out what you need, you keep on going. And obviously, um, one, you know, we do want to keep some of the emergency response capability in mind. So whenever possible, you do want to build yourself into a situation where you can operate uh, without the internet. Um, obviously, some of the stuff we're going to talk about doesn't happen without the internet, uh, but a lot of it can happen using um, commercial IP networks without it being uh, the internet, so to speak. Are there any questions on any of those concepts before we move on? Anything we can answer or clarify for anybody? Uh, Jason uh, and John, aren't we suffering from too many repeaters that, uh, you know, everybody has their little repeater that uh, two or three people talk on it uh, for a few minutes a day and somebody is on another repeater so they never mix. That went reducing the number of repeaters improve the usage and drive everyone to a common site. I think there's there's some downside to that too. You know, the whether it's the right way to go about it or not is the, you know, we as hams tend to lose frequencies if we can't demonstrate usage. And one or two busy repeaters does that, but I I believe that 
having 10 less busy repeaters, each with their own community on them, is probably a better case to make for, you know, we need this whole four megahertz spectrum of two meters, for example, uh, rather than a, you know, one megahertz slice all pushed up to the top. But um, yeah, you're right. I mean, there are, there do tend to be a lot of small um, local communities that have formed around all the repeaters that are out there now. Well, would not one repeater that has uh, 20 hours of use a day be more conducive to maintaining uh, frequency than uh, 20 repeaters that get 15 minutes of use a day? Yeah, I, I don't know. Yep. We'll talk a little on this slide um, about the some of the repeaters that, that we've had a hand in that uh, we'll, we're going to go over some of the components that we put together with them. Um, so a couple of these were, we're blessed to have a couple of high profile sites. So for example, Sarah's own 3.9 repeater, um, thanks to, to Marty's tower space that we're using, uh, is, is a fairly high profile machine. It's kind of the exception to this. The uh, one right below it there, the 442.275, the digital machine that Sarah owns, uh, is also fairly high profile. The ones that follow down are, I would say, more mid-level. So uh, the, the WWATF repeater there in Ripman is kind of a mid-profile machine. Uh, LDH there at Spring Hill is kind of mid-profile. Mid um, LDG, that's actually running out of my house at the moment, and I live up on a pretty good hill, but it's, it's more of a mid to low profile. Uh, W8WOO, We've done some work there and uh, we'll talk a little about what we've done on some of these. That's, that's probably a mid to high profile machine in Worcester uh, that's all star uh, linked. And, and the one that we have listed there is a, um, a multi-mode digital machine uh, that we've helped out the Worcester club get together. Uh, Marty has uh, three machines that we've done some all star work on and it gives you an idea of some of the equipment. And we'll, we'll get into some details here later in the presentation, but. He's got a six meter UHF and um, 1.2 gigahertz repeater uh, that are all running all star on Raspberry Pis that, that we helped uh, get the network together on. Uh, the Worcester Club also, the 14721 machine is now online with all star. Um, that's, that's a Raspberry Pi that uh, the Worcester Club runs and uh, pretty nice setup. And uh, if we get the phone calls back here, we'll have a, a 685 machine here in, in Ritman that'll be I would say probably a mid-profile machine uh, that'll also be a, an all-star based machine running on a Raspberry Pi and, and networked with, with what we're going to discuss here in a minute. So to give you an idea when you're using these repeaters, um, this, is, this is what you're talking through. So the uh, one on the left is KE8LDH. That's a multi-mode digital repeater up on the Spring Hill in Akron. So that's an old Vertex repeater. I think that's probably, um, that might be circa 95, 98. It's, it's pretty old. A uh, set of duplexers and you can see the Raspberry Pi there in the middle is the controller. Uh, that does the, all the digital modes. There to the right of that is a, a Marty's 1296 repeater. Um, that's also, that's basically two mobile radios, a duplexer. And then right in the middle there, you can see the Raspberry Pi lit up as the, um, uh, the uh, controller for that. And that is also all-star linked. That's full-time linked to Marty's 444.2 repeater. A couple other examples, so the uh, LDG machine. So that's a couple of Motorola uh, uh, GM300 radius radios and a Raspberry Pi. You'll, you'll see that Raspberry Pi photobombing all these repeaters pretty much. Um, at one point or another. The 375 machine in Ritman there on the bottom left, um, that's on a PVC rack, a couple of uh, GM 300s and, and a Raspberry Pi. Uh, then you see more of the, the traditional repeater that, that we've got linked. Um, this is the old rack, but most of the components are the same. So there on the right side, you'll see the uh, 14739 repeater and then um, about, uh, about a third of the way down is the UHF multi-mode machine that we're running there as well. So all those are inter-networked with, um, 
with some of the Raspberry Pi and the IP networks that we're going to talk about. All right, so some of the site connections, um, all of the main sites um, for the systems that we're talking about are connected with the uh, commercial five gigahertz Wi-Fi uh, that we've talked about. Um, we're using uh, Ubiquiti network gear. If you're familiar with that, it's a fairly um, high quality, relatively in, 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 terms of, in terms of commercial Wi-Fi gear, relatively low cost, um, wireless uh, five gigahertz microwave type connections. Um, the questions we do get is why don't you use um, broadband hamnet or AR Arden or HSM mesh or some of those technologies. Um, while those are all interesting technologies and they're, it's good for the people who are um, who are furthering the science in those, uh, there's a couple of restrictions. Um, the biggest one is the no encryption and no commercial restrictions are very limiting. Uh, the no encryption um, is, is particularly problematic as basically all the major protocols of the internet are encrypted these days. Um, you actually have to work fairly hard and go out of your way to unencrypt uh, especially control connections, such as remote terminals, remote screens, web servers, things like that. Um, you know, that, that, that stems from the FCC rules on the encrypted or obscured communications. Uh, and, and that just really at this point, um, it, it, it's more of a hindrance than a help. Uh, the other thing is no commercial uh, restrictions are fairly limiting. Um, mostly because, uh, you know, there are situations where you want to sort of have a scratch my back, I'll scratch your back uh, situation. Um, you know, uh, we do a little bit of support for Marty with some of his business um, over the, not the club owned pieces, but some of the other pieces that we help maintain. And if that was um, being done over the amateur bands, uh, we wouldn't be allowed to do that. Um, but we get a lot of mileage out of being able to help out in a couple different situations where we can uh, in return for uh, some other benefits. Uh, so that's really uh, very helpful. So there's really no advantage for us using those technologies in this particular situation. Um, all the, site, all the sites um, are currently IP'd um, with um, what's called Amper, um, the amateur radio um, packet network. Um, there's an entire address space out there for that. Um, it's all publicly routable, which if you've ever messed with trying to do a NAT connection through your home router, uh, you know why that's incredibly irritating. Um, the nice thing about the 44 net space is it's all publicly routable IP addresses. So all of our machines are directly quote unquote on the internet. And we're also starting to roll out IPv6 across most of the sites. Um, there's a little bit of hiccups in some of that, uh, but that's where the world's going. And uh, hams need to be ready for that just as much as anybody else. Um, we use um, tunneling, uh, which is basically transporting one type of connection inside of another connection. Uh, we use that very uh, heavily across this entire network. We and all of our um, access points for the internet are actually uh, in the cloud. <laughs> so uh, the ham, so amateur radio in the Akron area is in the cloud. <laughs> um, we we do we have um, some strategically located access points that are located at places around the internet. So for example, the main internet connectivity for our ham equipment is actually in California, which may seem odd, but from a network connectivity standpoint is actually very advantageous for most of the systems in our area because of how the internet works. We could actually have a connection that is geographically closer to us, but is from a network perspective further away. So you, when you're, especially when you're using tunneling connections, you want them to be as network wise close as possible rather than uh, geographic wise close as possible. Um, we're using a dynamic routing uh, for failover. We have several access points and we have several pass through the network so that if we lose any one particular location, uh, we can keep pretty much all the systems online. 
Um, <clears throat> most of the gear with the Wi-Fi links, they can all be interlinked without the internet in this setup. So uh, that's primarily between Rittman and Doylestown and Spring Hill and uh, potentially uh, Cuyahoga Falls uh, in the near future. Um, all of those systems can be linked online without having the internet available. Sites that don't have the Wi-Fi links, uh, we're using uh, some sort of local broadband connection uh, with a virtual private network. That works fairly well, but obviously uh, is not quite as resilient as the point-to-point -point microwave links. Are there any questions about uh, those last couple slides? Anything we can answer or clarify for people? Jason, I, I, I'm curious about the um, um, concept of uh, geographic versus network uh, proximity um, and, and why California? I, it, is it because of, of the pipes involved or, or um, it, it's, it's a curious uh, thing for me? Yeah, so um, when you're talking about IP networks, um, what, what you have to keep in mind is in, in IP networking terms, what's called a hop. So each packet, as it moves from system to system to system, is a hop. So the question becomes, how many hops do I have to go through to get from point A to point B? Um, the reason that's important in this application is since we're dealing with audio streams, which are fairly sensitive, not to speed, but to um, latency, which is the delay of the delivery of packets or jitter, which is the, um, which is having a disuniform time to deliver the packets is where you start to have problems. So when you want to get from point A to point B for a stream that is time sensitive, you want as few hops between you and your target as possible. Um, so since we're tunneling everything, where, we, where our tunnel comes out um, starts to become extremely important. Um, the reason we chose California is our, the service provider that we use for that is directly connected to a company called Hurricane Electric, um, which is an interesting name, but they are one of the world's largest um, what's called IP transit networks in the world. So they don't provide um, internet service to anybody. They provide internet service to the ISPs if that makes sense, Finally. right? So the advantage of Hurricane Electric is they have a huge number of what are called peers all over the world. So, um, so for example, um, with right now, all the links are either through Spectrum Internet or um, Doylestown Telephone essentially. Um, and both of those route through a large peering point in Chicago, which allows us to get directly onto the Hurricane Electric Network. And it's, so it's very quick and very short between those two points. So we have very good latency and jitter for that tunneled audio traffic. All right, thank you. Jason, this is Brian, WABPS. Um, the tunnels to virtual host in the cloud, um, what type of tunnels are those? Are they VPN tunnels, uh, encrypted, GRE, and what, um, what cloud solution are you using? So currently we're using a mix of GRE and IPIP tunnels. Um, originally we were doing um, OpenVPN and we ran into some problems with the OpenVPN solution where we would lose connectivity um, for reasons that we never really were able to satisfactorily explain. Um, we switched to IPsec, um, which works fairly well, but as, as you know, Brian can be oddly problematic. 
Um, and then we really took a look at the traffic that we were trying to tunnel and came to the conclusion that the things that really mattered were already encrypted and the things that didn't matter didn't benefit from encryption. So we changed everything depending on if it's an IPv6 connection. So if the endpoints, endpoint endpoint is an IPv6 address, we're using GREv6. Um, if it's an IPv4 to V4, we're using IP IP encapsulation. Nice. Thank and you. then for the cloud solution, Brian. Oh yeah. Uh, instead of using like uh, Azure or AWS, which we've we've tried both of them as well, we're using a, a company. It's called Free Range Cloud, and um, it's a it's a small outfit that has a data center in California, in Virginia, and I think is it Norway now, Jason? Or uh, Amsterdam. Amsterdam, that's and, right. And Winnipeg, don't forget about the Winnipeg data Winnipeg. center. Yeah, can't forget the Winnipeg site. <laughs> the, the nice thing about this guy is um, they allow us to advertise our own networks on the internet with BGP. So most companies, you, you're stuck with using whatever address space that they you know sell you. This guy, if you bring your own IP space, which we did, so we, we have some internet routable IP allocations. I guess it's a... Is it a slash 22 now, Jason? I think. Um, well, we have a 24 to 23. We're missing, yeah, we're we missing, we're missing one chunk to make it a full 22. Yeah. Yeah. So we've, so we've got, you know, we've got a couple, you know, almost a little over a thousand IP addresses um, that we can allocate. And this guy will let us advertise those with BGP to the internet, just like the big boys do. Um, and a lot of companies don't let you do that. So that's a, that's another, you know, nice feature to have with the provider. And he's a fellow ham. Yeah. <laughs> that's very cool. Yeah. Oh, if you have a question about the connection that you're talking about. Go ahead, Mark. You know, I just recognized uh, earlier this fall. I seen your know, Spectrum and Windstream. They uh, did a cross right at the central switch office in Aurora. They actually tied themselves together. So I like, you know, you're talking about the backbone out to Chicago and that. Maybe you know, maybe you know, maybe you don't know what they did there. But I seen they, you know, because they dropped Spectrum. You know, I know their line is that, and they had a, a bulk of cable drop down to the ground, and then. You know, then I seen the uh, wind stream. They did a little trenching into the building. Actually, they only went a couple of feet, and they they used an old conduit, I think, from an old telephone that you they used to have in front of the building. But they did that connection. And I said, "Wow, I never would have thought I would have seen that day come." Yeah, I mean, that could be a couple of things. Um, you know, that, that could be a direct connection. Doing that in, in Aurora seems a little unlikely, although I suppose that's possible. Um, you know, Spectrum as a company beyond a residential ISP also is a transit provider. Um, so maybe it could be that Windstream is purchasing service from Spectrum. Um, so th mm -hmm. there's, a couple, there's a couple different reasons why that might have been happening. You, usually the internet exchange points are um, at large um, facilities, not not necessarily, but are usually co-located in large cities. So Northern Virginia, New York City, Chicago, um, San Francisco, Los Angeles, those are usually the large aggregation points. Um, there's a fairly good sized one in Cleveland. Um, there's a couple fairly good sized ones in Pittsburgh, but those are still regional compared to, you know, something like Chicago. Any other questions on this one? All right, so this is just sort of a block diagram of the network as it exists today. Um, Lines in black are existing uh, microwave network connections. Um, so Doylestown is, we've been building out as the central hub, so to speak, of the, uh, 
the current western extent of the Megalink project. Um, we have a wireless link that goes from Doylestown, to, uh, excuse me, to the Spring Hill site in Akron. Um, we have a uh, extremely long distance microwave shot from Doylestown to Alliance. And John, you're gonna have to remind me of the distance of that link. Yeah, it's 26 miles. Yep. Yeah, so um, we were particularly pleased with, <laughs> with a 26 mile Wi-Fi connection. Um, and then we have a connection from Doylestown to Rittman. Um, we had hoped to add a connection from Doylestown to my house this fall for internet redundancy. Um, and a issue that's plagued me for five years has returned in that I have too many trees um, that are in the way. Um, so we got to think about how we're going to do that or if we're going to do that. Um, <clears throat> then John has a direct link uh, to the Rittman Water Tower. Um, what we are planning on, if we can uh, ever uh, get arrangements to get back up on the water tower, um, part of the extensive rework of that site is going to have a link directly from the Rittman Water Tower to Doylestown. And we're still trying to decide if we want to try it. It's pretty marginal, um, but do we want to try to bring Worcester, Worcester's site onto the Wi-Fi network? Um, the, the issue there is just Worcester's so low relatively speaking to Rittman, um, we're not sure that we can clear some of the trees that are in between. And then obviously the purple links go out to the cloud uh, provider that we were talking about. So um, we have an internet access point at Doylestown um, for the Hamnet. Um, we have an internet access point at John's house for the Hamnet. Um, a lot of the, uh, the, the transcoder and reflector services are actually at my house. Um, those tunnel over to the internet. And then I also have a direct tunnel to the Doylestown system. Uh, and then we have um, the Worcester clients, um, which use a um, Verizon air card that go out to the cloud. Yeah, here's a, uh, some pictures of some of those links. So this is, this is uh, you know, a picture representation of what you just saw in the block diagram. Um, the down there on the lower left, that's the, the standard equipment we're using on each of these endpoints. And that's about, um, I don't know, 16 or 18 inch diameter dish. It's, it's pretty small. Uh, so there on the, the upper left side, you'll see there's two dishes at the Akron Spring Hill site. That's up on a rooftop. Um, there on Marty's Tower, you can't really see them in the picture, but the, the arrows are pointing to uh, the Spring Hill and the, the dish back to my house. The Alliance dish is there on the other side of that tower. Um, um, the one that's on uh, the, my side of the Doylestown link is just a little dish that's tucked under the eaves of my house. So I've got a, a perfect line of sight across the valley, about five and a half miles there to Marty's Tower. Uh, and that's a, that's a great link across there. Um, up on my tower, I've got a little link that, uh, that shoots up to the west over to the water tower. And then on the Rittman water tower side there at the, um, there's a little radio hut there at the base of the water tower. We have a dish there that, that aims over to that. So all these links that we've been doing with ubiquity equipment are, are what you're seeing here. They're the, the small dishes. They're, uh, you know, by the time you buy a dish and a cover and um, the cable and everything, it's maybe $150 an endpoint. They're not, um, not big bucks, you know, compared to commercial stuff where you'd be, you know, you'd be talking five to 15 grand per endpoint, um, but they work pretty well for what they are. So I had a set of these, they're the, the five gigahertz ubiquity uh, mm -hmm. yep. links. Yep. They, they had a surprisingly uh, large amount of bandwidth for, you know, being that far away from each other. Yeah, they were great. And then if you, if you tune the bandwidth down intentionally, so, you know, they're on a, a five megahertz or a 10 megahertz wide channel, you can even get more range out of them and still get, you know, you can still move five or six megabits per second through no problem. Cool. Yeah, very nice. They yeah, do like I, and, I, and they don't like trees. Yeah. Well, and I think, I think John, one of that, that's an important point too. Um, in, a, in a number of cases, we're making a trade off of distance to bandwidth. So by narrowing the beam, we get a much stronger directional signal, but we can't push as much data through. But when we're talking about audio streams, the actual data rate 
is very small. So this goes back to the comment I made earlier. You know, if you want to stream a 4K Netflix video, our system would be terrible for that. Um, but for a, you know, 256K audio stream, such that you'd find in a high quality audio repeater, um, this system is perfect for that because we're not worried about about bandwidth, we're worried about jitter and latency. So we've optimized for that in this setup. And uh, continuing on, so at the base of those antennas, this is some of the, the IT infrastructure, so to speak. And this has changed a little bit since we've taken these and, uh, and forgive our cable management practices. But um, in Doylestown, the upper left side, you'll find a, uh, there, I guess it's at the, yeah, toward the top of that, we have a, a real router, uh, or I guess it's right below the switch there, we've got a real router. Um, not a, a home Linksys style router, but this is more of a commercial um, BGP routing capable router there. Uh, to get a few more switches, we've got, or switch ports, we've got a, uh, an HP um, 48 port switch. So we can plug lots of things in. Uh, up toward the top, there was the, uh, the power over ethernet adapters. Those dishes are all PoE, so you don't have to run separate um, power wires up to them. Uh, and then there toward on the very bottom shelf, there is a regular old home, you know, home type router on the left. And we just use that for local Wi-Fi. So when we're at the site, we turn that on and it just gives us a, a local internet access point to, to connect the phones up to. Over to the right there on that bottom shelf, there's two Raspberry Pis. Uh, one of them is the Echolink Pi. So when you connect to 3.9 with Echolink, you're actually connecting to that Pi right there that, uh, that's being highlighted. And then the one to the right is, we call it an infrastructure Pi. So that, that hosts, um, we did have the XLX reflector running on it and ended up moving that. But in the meantime, we've uh, added, uh, Jason's added some logging and monitoring onto that. And then we've got DNS and some other just infrastructure services all running there on that Raspberry Pi. Um, the picture in the middle, so this is part of the Spring Hill infrastructure. Um, there at the bottom, it's another you know typical Ethernet switch. Uh, the the stuff sitting on top of that, we're using that switch as a shelf too. And that's the there's an APRS digipeter, and I'll have to do a presentation on APRS sometime too. But the, the Akron Digipeter, that's that's it right there, that Motorola radio and the Cantronics TNC. Uh, and then up towards the top, there's a little Juniper router um, and, uh, and a, a remote serial device to, to get back into some things there. Uh, Ritman is uh, probably a little less formal looking, at least for now. So that's also a small Juniper router uh, power supply. And then of course, you'll see the there's a Raspberry Pi in the background photobombing that picture as well. We've got those things. I don't know how, I've kind of lost track how many pies we have out there now, Jason. I, it's over a dozen, I think. But I, I tried to count them and I kept coming at it. I kept, kept thinking of an additional one. So I don't right. know how that, many That's we what have I either. did. I need to make a list. Um, yeah. So pork roast, you know, I think we've called this out before, but this is you right here, buddy. Yeah. All right, so I think the last thing we're going to cover here um, is sort of this is a I think this will be a natural stopping point, and then we'll uh, cover um, the two main protocols that we're using um, for the next session. So, <clears throat> you know, the, some of the questions that we always get asked are about operating during emergencies. Um, you know, that is not necessarily a main focus of Sarah. Um, but it is something we want to be conscious of. Um, so there's a couple things. Um, All Star, um, which is a uh, system that connects FM analog repeaters um, to each other. Um, All Star is a peer-to-peer -peer system. Um, all the repeaters um, uh, on our system are internal to each other, so they can all see each other. They're controlled by DTMF codes. You just key in. And a really interesting feature of being able to use this system specifically is you can use the MT632 k data mode to transfer data across repeaters. 
And then I think a lot of people are probably familiar with PyStar. Um, we primarily use it for DSTAR and System Fusion. Um, the Worcester machine is using it for DMR. Uh, again, they're all internal, so we don't have to do any lookups. Um, we have changed it. I'll have to update this slide. Um, the reflector is not currently at Doylestown because what we've discovered is Doylestown was getting too hot and causing the system to fail. Um, what we really need is a is a remotely addressable power switch so we can turn it off to reset the chip every once in a while. Um, DSTAR is really only uh, is really the only of the three digital modes that's truly um, suited for operation during no internet situations due to how it works. Um, DMR and YSF both require centralized aggregation hubs. Uh, DSTAR itself can actually be connected repeater to repeater in the same way that Allstar does. So I think that that will be a good stopping point for today. Um, and we are actually exactly halfway through the slides, um, but I think this is a natural break point. Uh, in November, uh, we'll talk about the All-Star Link technology itself, as well as the um, as well as the uh, PyStar technology uh, that we're using, um, because I think a lot of people know PyStar from the uh, you know the hotspot uh, small radio system, but it, it's really important to recognize. Um, that PyStar can really be used for large repeaters as well. Um, but we're going to go ahead and stop there. Uh, we'll take any questions, any comments, any discussions you want to have on this topic. So I actually have a quick question uh, regarding uh, DMR in the sense of uh, usability without an internet connection. Um, I know there's the ability to um, run a C, a C bridge, say on your local network, like say somebody in within range of all the repeaters um, has a C bridge server running. Um, if there's connection to all of the, say all, all the repeaters that we have currently in our setup, um, would that still operate as long as they were connected to the C bridge if they lost their, like their main connection to uh, Brandmeister? So I don't think that would work with the Pi Star setup, right? Because I think um, Brandmeister does some translations in the middle of that, and if it's a, you know, a Motorola C bridge, for example, I don't believe we can attach directly to that, at least with Pi Star. Like yeah. it, it doesn't do the routing routing on its own. Well, right. so if it's local, right? So I, I think the one yeah. thing you have to realize, especially about DMR, is it's extremely centralized, and what hams are using it for, it was never designed to handle. Of course. Um, so you have so if you can can you stand up your own C bridge? Yes. Can PyStar connect to it? Eh, I don't know. I've seen some hacky stuff to make it work. I don't think it works very well. Um, but the thing to keep in mind is if you set up your own C-Bridge, you're not on the Brandmeister network, which is largely what people want DMR for. Now, you know, you could figure out a way to tie that together, but then that becomes problematic because if you have to take a full DMR feed from Brandmeister, that's a tremendous amount of trash. I mean, the, the problems with DMR at the scale that amateurs are trying to make DMR work it just was something that was never designed to do. And then the guys who have done it have done a great job. Um, and I but, know if you, you look know, at it's... Motorola, they never advertise the type of capacity that we've even gotten it to. Right. right. And, and, and you can see that, um, you know, Brandmeister does hiccup quite a bit. And like I said, I'm not taking anything away from the Brandmeister guys. They do a great job. Um, but you know, you're, they're, they're really overdriving the technology from what it was designed to do. Yeah. Now you can interconnect other things. So for example, um, I know at least with the Hytera DMR repeaters, you can directly connect those together, you know, and carry a talk group from one repeater to another with, without a C bridge in the middle, even, um, and just over any IP network, you know, there's no Seabridge, there's no Brandmeister, nothing in between, but you lose the connectivity to the to the outside when you do that. Um, I don't oh. know if you can do that with the Motorola built-in repeaters without a bridge, I would assume you probably could, but I don't know the answer to that. So what I had looked at is like a possibility, it, 
you know, as a, at least in my, at this point, just researching it and uh, using it as a learning experience. But um, I have a, a DR1X um, Yezu repeater. Um, never intend to use it on their digital system because never owned a radio that had that capability. Um, but I, you know, I've hooked it up to this, the Pi Star with the, um, with the board um, and it, it works. But the idea is have that somehow as a, as a failover to run, you know, locally and, and have your own, say, local IP connection. So if, if the main connection that actually makes the, 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 the connection between all of our repeaters and say the, the Brandmeister network fails, we can use our own local IP connections that are still working right. um, to, to just do that local traffic. Right. Yeah. So idea. yeah, it, it's a good idea. So the, so the one issue with that Scott becomes the logistics of the DMR program, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the advantages of D star, especially and system fusion is that if you don't want to interact with the programming either at the radio level or at the repeater level. It's just like analog FM where you can key up and talk to whatever the repeater happens to be doing at the time. The struggle with DMR is you would have to have a specific channel zone scan list configuration just for that particular situation. And you'd have to have everybody who wants to use that situation all have the same program. So, gotcha. so that, that, that's really where you run into some of the struggles with DMR. Again, it's a great technology that hams are overdriving what it was actually designed to do because DMR, one of the design goals of DMR was to keep people apart, <laughs> not, <laughs> you know, not bring them together. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's an, it, it's an interesting situation. You know, one of the things that we've thought about um, and we'll probably add at some point, we need one more transcoder chip, is actually to set up the ability, to, and when we get 685 on the air, I think we'll probably tackle this, um, is we can transcode analog FM into D-Star, System Fusion, and DMR um, fairly simply. We have the infrastructure to do it now, uh, just at the moment we don't have any particular reason to do it. And I think that if, you know, in a true grid down emergency, I think what you would really want to do is connect every type of repeater possible together to the same system and then not have to worry about users having a program, you know, or a code plug on their radio for that situation. And, and that's really where you run into the struggles with DMR. Yeah, and the, I guess the logistically be, make having the system set up to where it would do the switch autonomously in the situation where the network was down, that would be. Well, and unfortunately DMR just doesn't work that way. Right. I mean, you, you, you would, you would be at the situation where you'd have to figure out a way to forge every talk group. Um, yeah. If you wanted to do that. Um, and I'm not sure that that's even possible because the packets themselves are labeled with their talk group. Um, so you know, you, there, there's just a lot of scalability issues with something like that, unfortunately. But I, I approve of the use of the DR1X not on the wires X network. I don't know if, you, <laughs> if you've seen the WW8TF club site, um, but we have some extensive blogging about modifying the DR1X to be a good repeater. Okay, I should check that out. Uh, yeah, it's, I actually, a, it's a pretty good machine for what you're using it for there, Scott. In, in my attempts to, you know, open it up and learn about the repeater itself, I actually somehow got it into um, single single radio mode. To, so the display looked like the, uh, I can't remember what the, the name of that radio oh, is. Oh, like the 400, huh? <laughs> yes. And so it, it was displaying as if it was a 400. And so there's a special combination of keys you have to press, but those keys aren't, those keys don't have a button on them on the repeater oh. so i had to take it apart and and short them out by hand and finally oh, went back into repeater mode and that's not documented and yesu says it's not possible however i was able to fix it lies <laughs> lies <laughs> holy cow but i'd like to i'd like to make it useful and, and come up with some 
valid use for the computer. Well, if you if you check out www.tf.club, there's three articles that I've written. Um, one that talks about common modification considerations, one that talks about how to properly graft it into a Pi Star, and one that talks about how to graft it into an All Star analog repeater controller. Okay. Hey, Brooker. Hey, good evening. Hey, Brooker. <laughs> hey, anybody okay. else uh, have any questions for John and uh, Jason? Anything else before we pull the plug tonight? A great presentation, man. Yeah, it's uh, I, and um, it um, very eye opening, and uh, we certainly appreciate you guys uh, uh, doing this. And we're looking forward to next month's uh, uh, rendition.